evening, everyone. Hi. Hello, Jim. Yeah, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'll just read some brief words uh, from this presentation, and then we'll get a, a start. Um, can everybody hear well, or there's a bit of feedback? Yeah, there we go. OK. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first contemporary conversation of this year, a series of events engaging uh, with contemporary visual cultures positioned to its present. In addition to convening this gathering, I have the great pleasure to thank your presence from the beginning, those here with us today, and this extends to showing our gratitude to the University of Nottingham, Nottingham Trent University, for generously and graciously supporting our events. To, not, to our colleagues uh, for carving out the, the, the time to create a caring research environment uh, here at the Contemporary. And in addition, I would like to acknowledge James Brower, who's our brilliant technician uh, supporting us today, and Adep, who's uh, our gallery assistant, also supporting us this evening. Uh, and of course, uh, Café Otar for lending us these beautiful plants. Um, our gratitude also goes uh, first and foremost to our speakers, Sheila Sheikh and Michael Martyr, who I'll introduce in a short moment. The format of our conversation this evening is quite informal and welcomes questions and comments. Uh, our speakers will share their individual presentations for about approximately 30-40 minutes, uh, and this will be followed by 5-10 to 10 minutes questions for any concerns that directly relate to the presentations, and thereafter we have a generous time for discussion. Um, there will be two roving mics um, passing by, so feel free to raise your questions and comments. Um, some housekeeping notes, important. Uh, there's one fire exit to this space, which is on your uh, left hand side. Um, there's also two toilets which are placed on the left, to, so on the exit to the right. I'm sorry, I am dyslexic, so please forgive me. So on the right hand side, feel free to um, take your time to go to the toilet um, in the middle of the event if necessary. Just walk in and out mindfully. Um, lastly, um, I'd like us to take our time to silence our mobile phones and just bring our awareness to the space. Well, acknowledging artists' role in neither coinciding nor departing from their time but working with its passage, pressing and transforming it, the series of evening dialogues explores the present tense in its cultural and political dimensions, visual cultures, and post-colonial debates. Each dialogue aims to convene scholars, writers, thinkers, whose practice resonates with artistic research in ways that are rather oblique. These contemporary conversations traverse the artworks on view, expanding outwards into the world to ask urgent questions about things that cannot easily be pinned down. They are oblique points of entry, as Edith Rogoff would have it, that refuse the straightforward ones, reflecting on how artists have struggled on, with how discrete histories of identity, military and territorial conflict, differing experience of colonialism and so forth, continue to shape worlds. This evening we'll explore vegetal life and our relenting uprooting from this world. Opposite to plants, whose existence is premised on retribution, arguably more than return, in the form of oxygen, roots, herbs, agricultural products, and eventually fossilized forms of energy, uh, European and Western thinking have brought us to a moment in time where we, no we are no longer surrounded by forest, but rather by the immense, unfiltered, unabated light of the Enlightenment, casted by worldwide deforestation human reason above all else. We are no longer canopied by overhanging trees, but by the possibility that everything has become a transparent glass architecture of our mind. One in every five plant species is currently on the brink of extinction. Landscapes and vegetation are still used as the backdrop against which colonial dispossession is mobilized. While the expansion of intensive agriculture and industrial settlement has contaminated, eroded, drained, burned, flooded, and depleted the surface of our planet on a worldwide scale. In response to such offenses against the earth, can the root systems of plants, their paths, uh, lines, traces, upwards and downwards, 
their offshoots, their seeds, their fertile compostable demise, illuminate the workings of capital and power, nature and culture. What does he mean to spend time with nature rather than in nature? I oftentimes find refuge in the forest where life grows in all directions, also sideways towards me. Michael Martyr, here with us today, has put it brilliantly, and I quote, in being with plants, everything slows down to the pace of their growth. I find myself thus in communion with everything they are and live with, and I am together with myself differently. I become myself otherwise. Hence, it is in this slowdown that another cultivation of life is realized. I'll start by introducing Michael, to whom I'm indeed grateful for the many inspiring, albeit seldom, conversations over the years. In an extended letter exchange published in the book format with the well-known French feminist philosopher Lucie Rigaray, uh, Michael reveals, and I quote, whenever I am invited to give a public talk on the subject of my vegetal research, I secretly hope that I might take place in the presence of both human and plants. I want my words and my writing to circle back to the trees and flowers, the, shrub, the shrubs and grass, even if they are addressed to fellow humans. Michael, we hope that the foliage we're in today um, can be a good interlocution. Michael is a philosopher based in Lisbon, whose long-term commitment to vegetality is the subject of various monographs and articles, including The Philosopher's Plant and Intellectual Herbarium, Through Vegetable, uh, vegetable Being, pardon, Energy Dreams, among others. He's also Iker Basque Research Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Basque Country, and tonight he will be addressing how plants think, how think, our thinking about plants, and the dynamic interaction between the two, following, following onwards to how plants listen, our listening to plants, and the resonances between our auditory senses. It is important to position this conversation from the perspective of listening. Representation traces only a fine line between injustices done to others and the various violences that accompany speaking for them. As, it, as extinction is positioned in the dual respite between life and death, we must ask who is going to die and who is going to die first. While the problem of speaking for others continue to be a genuine conundrum in academia, the unrepresentable nature should ring a kind of post-colonial and feminist bell. In her landmark essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, Gayatri speak, uh, Spivak prefigures the discussion of political speaking on the behalf of others. Th three decades later, it is time for us to attune to the ways in which na nature makes itself expressive. Who is entitled or ought to speak in the name of whom is one of the key concerns driving Shella's shake research in the context of environmental testimony. We have been inattentive to the sonorities of nature to their claim to legal rights, to the slow protracted ways in, in which dip, disproportionate harm uh, vegetable life has been witnessed to. In the onset of a sixth mass extinction event, this is a very difficult combination of three words, as enjoyable as uh, 20 degrees weather has been, uh, we must account for differential vulnerabilities, the ways in which race and class come into play in the making of our abilities and responsibilities in dealing with climate change. Sheila will address the pitfalls of silence and the ways in which it is not differentiated from the vital construction of race and nature in modern colonial imaginaries. By returning to Daniel Stigman Mangrame's exhibition, I don't know if you've had the chance if, to see it, if not, feel welcome to visit over the weekend. Um, but not only. Uh, Sheila will be touching upon our past exhibitions and public programs, such as Rights of Nature in 2015, Ecologies of Value in 2013, for grounding the long-term concerns of this institution. So Sheila teaches in the Department of Media, Communications and Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths, University of London, where she convenes the MA in Postcolonial Culture and Global Policy and co-chairs the Goldsmiths Critical Ecologies Research Stream. In recent years, she has been working on a multi-platform research project around colonialism, botany, and the politics of planting. Sheila is currently working on a book project that addresses nature, race, and more than human witnessing, some of which we will be addressing this evening. 
Without further ado, I would like to invite you to joining and welcome and welcome pardon, join me in welcoming our speakers who will grace us with the um, with the words. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, Sophia, first of all, and thank you, Nottingham Contemporary, Carolina as well, and the technical crew, and it's a pleasure to be here in conversation with Michael. I think we're going to have some hopefully really beautiful resonances between, between the papers. Um, so I'll begin, just to keep time, I want to begin with a quotation from the anthropologist Eduardo Colm from a conversation that he had with Daniel Stiegman Mangrané uh, in 2018. I'm actually not going to talk about Stiegman's work, Stiegman Man Mangrané's work so much, but it's a kind of prompt, certainly, for, for thinking these issues through. Um, so this, this is the text, which is uh, actually available on his website, and I would recommend having a look at it. So with reference to his now seminal 2013 book, Get, is to get that, to enter into that world which is not made by us. And the way to enter is to, is to listen. So it's the listening, not the speaking, that's important. You have to learn to open yourself to something that is not part of your world or way of thinking, end quote. So in what follows, I'll be circling around this notion of listening in terms of questions of voice, quote unquote, silencing and epistemological deafness, let's say, or blindness, as these pertain to the entanglement between human and non-human rights, and crucially, the complexities of representation, as Sophia already mentioned. So I have to admit that when I talk about listening, I'm using it in quite a sort of expanded, loose sense in terms of rep receptivity and openness. I think Michael will be talking much more specifically about listening as a sort of sensorial or a communicative form and in relation to plants. So in many senses, I share with Stigman, Stigman Mangrané a skepticism about representing nature. But I'll be addressing this from a slightly different and indeed a broader perspective, not so much in terms of the impossibility of representation, and this is something that the exhibition is framed in terms of that impossibility, but more its ambiguities and its possible violences. So more specifically, in order to cut, cut a path through an enormous field, I'll be approaching this through the prism of witnessing, or what we might name a testimonial constellation, or testimonial constellations in the plural, because they're always different and situated. So here I'm drawing from current work on nature, race, and environmental violence, as Sophia mentioned, and what I'm theorizing in current writing is more than human witnessing. So to give some context, my interest lies specifically in testimony from the perspective of both humans and non-humans. So the backdrop against which I'm speaking is that of neo-colonial environmental violence that's enacted globally against both racialized human bodies and against nature. And with this, the entanglement of abuses of human and non-human rights. So just to stress that entanglement. So for a start, violations of human rights have been and continue to be car often carried out through the environment, through the natural environment. So for instance, through scorched earth tactics, environmental remodeling, planting, the creation of enclosures, and dispossession through land grabbing. So moreover, in the context of environmental racism, such violations are often enacted against racialized populations who are culturally and politically rendered disposable or sacrificable. So for instance, climate refugees or those denied access to water or drinkable water, exposed to higher levels of pollution and toxicity 
or remove from their land in the name of the profitability of extractive capitalism, or in a more sinister move, remove from their land in the name of conservation. <clears throat> so what I'm interested in is the political silence of creatures and landforms that we call nature. And I'm using sort of invisible quotation marks whenever I use the word nature, the whole point being that there is no single stable nature. So landforms, creatures and landforms that we call nature, um, and the silencing that takes place where nature is treated as an object, so a resource without voice and without rights. Moreover, when nature is treated as an object that needs to be protected by humans, but only, importantly, by certain kinds of humans. So the question of who is entitled to or who ought to speak in the name of whom is one of my concerns. Above all, in the context of silencing and the constructed categories of the active and passive or the subject and object, as these play out across race, nature, and shifting conceptions of the human. So often, as the anthropologist Leslie Green writes, who has the right to advocate for nature is profoundly racialized. She's writing from the South African context, but we could say the same in many different contexts. Since voices raised in the protection of nature have an uneasy time escaping the scripts of race and racism. So key here is the subject-object relation that must be read through the legacies of colonial categorization of forms of life in which the violence that is racism functions through the classification of some as subjects who have the right to speak, and others who are silent, reduced to objects or things in a racial imaginary in which some people are reduced to non-human, to the non-human, or less than human, classed as a lesser species. In other words, classed as closer to nature. So with respect to the figure of the witness, over the past few years, I've been struck by the appearance of terms referring to non-human entities as witnesses in the context of artworks. So for a start, many visual and literary works mobilize the idea of landscape or nature as an archive. And I'm just, I'll just show two examples. There's many others I can discuss, but for the sake of time, I'll stick to these. So this is a work by Paolo Tavares and Ursula Biman called Forest Law, which looks at the violent history of colonization and extractive capitalism in the context of what they call the earthly memory of the mud of the Ecuadorian Amazon. So, and this is something I'll be coming back to in a while. So in this case, it's not so much a metaphor, but there are many other artistic works where the idea of, sort of nature as archive um, or nature as holding memory is mobilized. But there's a difference between speaking about archives as a kind of repository of information and traces and narratives and violations, and speaking about witnesses in terms of active subjects who narrate and express or relate events that have occurred to them. So another work that came to mind, uh, these are more installation shots of forest law, is the work of Maria Teresa Alves um, that's... Uh, um, Seeds of Change. So this is an ongoing investigation based on original research of ballast flora in the port cities of Europe. It was actually in uh, Liverpool some years ago. Sorry, Bristol. Um, and more recently in New York City. She did a basically a kind of colonial uh, archaeology, a, bo a botanical archaeology of New York, New York City. So materials such as stones, earth, um, wood and bricks were used as ballast to stabilize merchant sailing ships according to the weight of the cargo. Upon arrival in port, the ballast was unloaded, carrying with it seeds native to the area where it had been collected. So the source of these seeds can be any of the ports in the regions and their regional trading partners involved in trade with Europe. Um, and what struck me is that in the words of the, for the late critic Jean Fisher, Seeds here function as what she calls migration silent witnesses. So the seeds themselves, as with the plant forms, become witnesses precisely where there are no human witnesses left to testify. So of course we can think about the sort of trade, of human trade as well. We can think about the global slave trade and the sort of transportation of goods um, 
Fisher was actually speaking at the Rights of Nature conference here in 2015 that was already mentioned. So beyond what I believe to be the poetic generativity of such terms in the realm of metaphor, the witness, the archive, my question is, what does it mean to speak of nature as a witness? And can we speak in literal terms here? So this question um, drives a larger project in which I outline what I call the future of the witness. So I'm using this term in the grammar of the double genitive to refer to two things. So first of all, the idea that especially faced with climate change and environmental violence and environmental racism, there is a need to reconceptualize and critically and legally expand our understanding of the witness as we move into the future. And secondly, that rather than simply referring to past events, that we ask whether and how witnessing might function in both the present and the future. So leaving aside this sort of temporal or futural aspect for the purposes of this evening, I'll just state that I'm arguing that where what is demanded is collective action, the witness can no longer be a solitary figure. So rather the witness must be but one of many within a collectivity. So moreover, it's precisely in the context of a collectivity that the witness figure is produced, inscribed within a particular social and, of course, we can say ecological milieu. So inscribed within a relational testimony or testimonial constellation. So although the figure of the witness has traditionally been confined to the human, where what is at stake is care for both human and non-human or more than human life, witness collectivities need necessarily entail an expansion beyond the category of the human. So just to be clear, I'm not proposing that nature itself um, be conceived as witness, strictly speaking, insofar as this would entail a risk of anthropomorphism so a risk of sort of granting nature the status of the human witness. So rather my argument is that witnesses are produced in the context of more than human socialities between the human and the non-human. So I'm by no means the first to propose that the figure of the witness be extended beyond the human. In the legal context, and this was the subject of the exhibition and the conference in 2015 here on the rights of nature, so in the legal context, practices and theorizations of non-human rights or the rights of nature, and with this shifting conceptions and categories of personhood, legal standing, as well as voice, have done much to make nature inhabit the courtrooms of national and transnational forums as potential witnesses of legal violations. So there are notable references, for instance, the work of Susan Shupley, and I'm going to come back to her work, um, who since 2005, both through art practice and theoretical writings, has been developing the idea of the material witness. So this is an operative concept that foregrounds what she calls the expressive qualities of non-human matter and demonstrates how media artifacts and environmental conditions themselves bear witness not only to events, but also to the sorting and the registration processes that are imposed upon them in order for them to qualify as evidence in the first place. And she's asking how, and this in a work like this one, which I'll return to, she's asking how objects and environments are made to speak as witnesses to crimes and violations. So Shupley's work was formative for another important reference, this being the forensic aesthetics upon which the work of the Goldsmiths-based research group, uh, Forensic Architecture, or it's now an agency, which arose in the context of the fallibility of human testimony, is based. So in the absence of reliable human witnesses, forensic aesthetics turns instead to the agency of matter, be it organic or inorganic, including natural environments, or to object witnesses to question factual reality as expressed by the state. So as mentioned, in conceiving of nature as witness, we run the risk of anthropocentrism, 
and well-intentioned gestures of advocacy, so of speaking for or giving voice, as Sophia already mentioned, knowingly or inadvertently entail the possibility of silencing. So as the feminist scholar of environmental humanities, Astrida Naimanis states in an article entitled No Representation Without Colonization, the warnings posed by Gayatri Spivak in her seminal 1988 essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, prove as prescient as ever, albeit in Naimanis' reading relating to different forms of subaltern. So in this case, we now see the dangers of speaking for and misrepresenting not only humans, often more often than not indigenous um, subjects, but also nature. So as Spivak had famously asserted, attempts to represent the subaltern are often predicated upon an epistemic violence that constitutes the colonial of subject as other. Spivak points to the blindness of French post-structuralist thinking regarding the implications of imperialism in this epistemic violence. In short, if, as Spivak tells us, the subaltern cannot speak, this has everything to do with the, their addressee or their spokesperson in our context not being able to hear. So in Spivak's words, speaking of, um, sorry, in Spivak's words, it's important to acknowledge the Western and post-colonial theorists or academics complicity in the muting of the subaltern. As anthropologist Rosalind Morris writes, the corollary corollary, that's tricky, question to that of whether the subaltern can speak, i.e. how can we learn to listen, remains radically open. So in Naimanis' reading, things are pushed to the extreme and the conundrum remains as to whether any form of representation, however well-intentioned, necessarily involves at least some form of colonization. So a rendering passive or mute or a silencing so representation, especially in the defense of the rights of nature, remains what she calls an impossible necessity, an experience of being trapped between what, and I think she puts it nicely here, she calls a representationalist rock and a hard place of complicit silence. So paradoxically speaking, practically speaking, sorry, there are various manners through which we might think this can't but must paradox or the impossible necessity of representing non-humans. So to be clear, Spivak does not suggest that we do away with representation altogether. And in the context of environmental violence, this is also certainly not an option. So I'm not suggesting that nature be retrieved and ushered into the category of the subject. Rather, or I mean maybe, we can complicate that, but not in a simplistic manner. So rather that we remain attentive to the possible mechanisms of silencing between the two senses of representation that Spivak reminds us of in German, and this is like a lot of the essay is sort of spinning upon the mistranslation of Marx um, in German. So she talks about representation in terms of Vertreten, so the art of persuasion or rhetoric in terms of the sort of political proxy. And then representation as Darstellung, so a tropology or an aesthetic representation, a representation as portrait. And I think this is something we can maybe talk about more in terms of artistic practices, the sort of move between the two. So we need to be attentive to the sort of possibilities of misrepresentation between those two. But nature does, despite all these sort of problematics in terms of speaking for or representing nature, we need to acknowledge that nature does, in fact, represent itself. So for a while, for, for a start, we know that vegetal life has highly complex means of communication, um, which is something to which I'll return in the context of the forest. So Naimanis speaks of nature's capacity to write itself. So she looks at ice and water's capacity to materially register traces and as such to destabilize any rigid boundary between nature and culture. So one as passive, inert matter, there to be consumed and rendered transparent. The other, the consumer, the renderer. As Shukri's work shows, in particular um, the series Slick Images and Nature Represents Itself, 
environments themselves are expressive. Oh, I'll explain these images. They're expressive. So polluted environments, for instance, contain vast photosensitive surfaces that register and record the changes caused by modern industrialization. So this can be mobilized by the practice of forensics, in which such traces are read and narrated by the be it expert or non-expert witness in the quest for accountability and exposure. So to elucidate in the two series, Slick Images and Nature Represents Itself, in both works, Shupli analyzes the Deepwater Horizon oil spill of 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. And so you have sort of typical mediatic um, extreme images of the event. Arguing through the artworks and the accompanying commentary that the oil slick itself, beyond external images, so these being the satellite images or the media images from nearby, um, that the oil slick itself, um, beyond the images of the spill, it operationalized an independent mode of cinema as what she names a slick image. And these are underwater images. So we've got the sort of difference between images that are being taken from without and the sort of environment itself producing its own image. Um, so this is part of the slick images that she's talking about. She's done sort of re-renderings of the oil spill. So for Shupli, the cinematic capacity of the oil spill is a feature of its very ontology, its molecular structure and its behavior. As such, the oil slick can be understood as engaged in the production of a new form of cinema organized by the found footage of nature itself. So the conditions that brought about the disaster are thus re-expressed as an ontological rearrangement of molecular matter, <coughs> a shift from the representation of the damaged drilling rig and its gushing crude to the actualization of a ruinous image. So a further example would be um, these are more uh, stills from the rendering that she produced of the oil slick. So a further example would be Jennifer Gabris's work on sensing lichens, which, although based in the putative West, engages with many uh, key post- and decolonial representational quagmires. So Gabris is principal investigator on the London-based Citizen Sense project, which investigates the relationship between technologies of environmental sensing and citizen, i.e. non-expert, engagement. So this particular project concerns bioindication, a process by which environmental pollution registers in the bodies, in habitations, and relations of organisms. So Gabris's project opens up a number of avenues that are relevant to a potential reconceptualization of the witness. So first of all, that of the speech of the no longer simply human witness. So rather than mobilize the metaphor of a nature that speaks, as is common in environmental campaigns, for instance, this hugely problematic um, project where <laughs> elements of nature are ventriloquized by famous movie stars, um, Gabris instead refers to lichens as bioindicators as such avoiding anthropomorphizing nature or the granting of rights or voice to the non-human. So secondly, uh, back to the lichens. Secondly, Gabris's focus on speculative engagements uh, challenges the notion of any given organism, be it a witness or otherwise, as an individual and stresses how what constitutes human, quote unquote, is not a fixed entity, but can shift in relation to different milieu. She's drawing on the work of Simondon's uh, notion of individuation here. So drawing from Alfred North Whitehead and Isabel Stengers, speculative for Gabris, signals, quote, the distributed capacity of organisms and environments to generate new modes of encounter together with new propositions for ways of being. So thirdly, in her emphasis on lichens as environmental subjects and participants in collective communities engaged in multi-species world-making projects, 
Gabris provides a useful point of orientation in debates around representation through the notion of perspective. So environmental sensing is here approached from a shift in perspective, with the task being, quote, to consider how these inverted modes might open up other approaches to environmental conflict by encountering pollution from the point of view of other organisms, end quote and through other organisms' accounts, quote-unquote. So importantly for the post- or the decolonial context, Gabris argues that bioindication, through these multiplying points of view, also de demonstrates how nature itself is not a stable referent. So rather, drawing from Eduardo Viveros de Castro's book Cannibal Metaphysics, nature can in fact be understood, quote, as a realm where diversity multiplies towards a multinaturalism, where organisms might also be approached as persons and as having perspectives as persons. So it's in this, in this sense that a new politics might begin to take shape. So Viveros de Castro's work has been formative for the work of uh, Paolo Tavares and Ursula Biman, which I already showed earlier on forest law. So this multimedia installation included in the Rights of Nature exhibition here in 2013 is based on long-term research into the Ecuadorian Amazon as a site of conflict between the Quichua people of the Sarayaku and the oil industry. So in the work we see how the Quichua turn to the courts of law, for instance the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, in order to make claims for the protection of the environment they inhabit. So the landmark case, Quichua indigenous people of Sarayaku versus Ecuador, was vital for the rights of nature that were subsequently introduced into the Ecuadorian constitution in 2008. And there are many extracts from the testimonies that are in publications that accompany um, the project. For instance, there's one uh, publication here. Uh, I've left out the image. So as Tavares and Beeman demonstrate, the forest court, as they call it, deeply rooted as it is in, in, in situated histories of colonial violence, is an exemplary space for, quote, calling for the constitution of a universalist, multi-species politics beyond the human, end quote. And this politics, to evoke the title of this evening's event and the sort of planning therein, is decidedly spatial and perspectival, almost we could say architectural. So I quote them. They say, if modern sciences are based on an incremental process of objectification of reality, Amerindian sciences are based on the art of perspectivism, a mode of perceiving and engaging with the world as a multiplicity of worlds instead of a single object unity. And then further on, they state, in contrast to Western cosmology, where the social is restricted to the domain of the human species, in Amerindian thought, the space between humans and non-humans, people and nature, is from the outset a socialized space. So Tavares and Mbiman quote from Viveros de Castro and Deborah Dan Danowski's co-authored book, The Ends of the World, which I gloss from. So they write how we, i.e. those of us who are embedded within Western cosmology, may think, or may like to think, that it is only possible to be human in society, that man is a political animal, and so on. But what we, quote unquote, call the environment is for Amerindian thought a society of societies, an international arena, a cosmopol cosmopolitea, so what we would call the natural world is for Amazonian peoples a multiplicity of intricately connected multiplicities in which animals and other species are conceived of as people or societies, i.e. as political entities. So it's not simply that the jaguar, for instance, is human, quote-unquote. It is an individual jaguar it is individual jaguars that take on a subjective dimension, 
precisely when they are being perceived as having behind them a society, a collective political alterity. So recalling my introduction about race, nature, and the subject-object relation, we read, there is therefore no absolute difference in status between society and environment, as if the first were subject, society, and the second, environment, the object. Every object is another subject and is more than one, end quote. So furthermore, as uh, Tavares and Lehman write, such a conception of the forest as a cosmopolitea implies that every being that inhabits the forest, so be it trees, jaguars, peoples, are some sort of city dwellers. That is, that they are citizens within an expanded polity formed by complex material and symbolic ties between, nature and, between society and nature. So the nature of nature is social and hence the ways that we imagine, relate to, and represent nature, whether in the forums of art or law, are fundamentally political. So the politics, the forest is a polis, the political arena where both the concepts of human and rights are being defined. So this view of the forest as a polis is explored further by Tavares in various texts. For instance, in the essay, the, in the ruins of Amazonia, uh, this is the, the publication of theirs, and in a contribution to the publication, the word for world is still forest, and I think this is just a publication worth, worth noting, edited by Anna-Sophie Springer and Etienne Tepin, and the book, which is a kind of exhibition publication, is a reference to Ursula Le Guin's 1972 novella, The Word for World is, is Forest. So Tavares shows how the forest uh, yeah, stay there. Tavares shows how the forest, so the supposedly natural non-urban environment without history, is in fact a designed construction that results from various from the various ways that indigenous societies engage, manipulate, and transform the land. So this, of course, is contrary to the standard cartographic interpretations, Western, colonial, um, that portray the Amazon as an undisturbed environment. So recalling my earlier mention of an expanded sense of listening and a possible deafness and silencing, Tavares shows how this optical blindness in mapping is to a large extent the spatial correlative of an epistemological myopia that has historically conditioned the ways in which modern sciences have interpreted the, nation, the nature of Amazonia. So before concluding, I'd just like to return briefly to the work of Eduardo Cohn, who I mentioned, who I quoted at the outset. So if, as I mentioned earlier on, the figure of the witness is produced in a testimonial constellation, a study such as Cohn's is exem exemplary for conceiving of different species or forms of life um, as deeply entangled and mutually constitutive. So Cohn's work, although not by any means relieving us of the problems that, that I began to set out into regarding representation, provides an interesting alternative framework. As he says, he spent much of his time during field work, his ethnographic work, trying to listen, often with a tape recorder in hand, to how people in everyday contexts relate to their ex experiences with different kinds of beings. So the interlocutors here were usually human, I'm quoting from him, and usually runa, but conversation, quote unquote, also occasionally involved other kinds of beings. So the squirrel cuckoo who flew over the house, whose calls so radically changed the course of discussions down below, the household dogs with whom people sometimes need to make themselves understood, the woolly monkeys and the powerful spirits that inhabit the forest, and even the politicians who trudge up to the village during election season. With all, with all of these, people in Avila struggle to find channels of communication. So to put things straightforwardly, as we are told by the voiceover in the forest law film, which draws from Cohn's book, as well as Michel Serre's book, The Natural Contract, and James Lovelock's book, The Revenge of Gaia, 
we, we hear and we see through the subtitles, the forest lives and thinks. We humans are not the only ones who interpret the world. All living beings do. They continuously interpret and represent the world around them. Life is semiotic. All living beings think. So acknowledging that other beings represent the world through their thinking changes our understanding of human exceptionality. Drawing from the philosopher Charles Pierce's work on semiotics, Cohen attempts, quote, to situate representation in the workings and the logics of a broader non-human universe out of which we humans come, end quote. So representation in Cohen's analysis is more expansive than various social theories' understanding of it. So be these humanist, post-humanist, structuralist, post-structuralist. So rather, inspired by Frank Salomon's work on the representational logics of Amazonian knotted cords, and Janice Nuckel's work on Amazonian sound images, Cohen explores representational forms that go beyond language and beyond the human, as such forcing a radical reconceptualization of the task of anthropology itself, hence the subtitle, An Anthropology Beyond the Human. So of course this we can fold back through my earlier discussion about this of witness figure and whether we can call nature um, witness in terms of its linguistic capacities and its expressive and representational capacities. So to conclude, we might recall Gavris's evocation of world-making and speculative practices. So with a rich heritage in feminist technoscience, this, quote, allows for certain subjects and relations to gain a foothold, end quote. So just as the rights of nature are only in part about what we know as quote-unquote nature, such world-making practices are formed across species. So rather than rights, voice, or membership of an environmental public being extended or granted to non-humans, persons, i.e. co-witnesses, are produced perspectively in and by situated relations between humans and non-humans. So with regard to Cohn's anthropology beyond the human, the words of Anna-Sophie Springer and Etienne Tepin are prescient, as they write in the introduction to an interview with Cohn that is included in the, the publication I mentioned earlier, the word for world is still forest, quote, <clears throat> Whilst the po while the post-natural regime of the industrialized forest turns a complex ecosystem into an object that's measured, passed, and standardized for human purposes on a grand scale, the animated forest that's mediated by Cohn reminds us that other worlds are not only possible, but that they already exist. Are there any questions to, to Sheila? There's one right there. Thank you again. I think there's going to be many questions coming out of this. Very interesting. Uh, you referred several times to the rights of nature. I just wonder what responsibilities you think non-human nature has. Responsibilities? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, how would, are you t phrasing that in terms of a kind of moral or ethical yeah. framework. Yeah. I wouldn't want to impose the sort of anthropocentric frameworks of morality in terms of obligations. It's I think the we language can language becomes ambiguous if you use yeah. similar language to talk about different things. Yeah. I think in I'm talking about rights in terms of nature being the sort of being able to claim rights, but I wouldn't want to impose a language of morality or obligation. But, but no I think, responsibilities. Yeah. Because mm. I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a danger that we're using language in two ways to talk yeah. about two different sorts of things. Because obviously, clearly, humans have responsibilities and whether or not we fulfill them yeah. well is, is, a, is, a, is a point of tissue in the world as we are now. But the idea that you know, how forests think <clears throat> implies some sort of similarity. 
Mm. And I just suspect that, 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 that there isn't that similarity. Yeah, but I wasn't, I wasn't imposing a, a language of responsibility. Um. Hmm? Where do the rights come from? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, no, I think we can talk about the way in which... So, I mean, nature's inherently violent, of course. We know that. And I think it would be wrong to start sort of imposing laws of pacification upon nature. Um, so it's more in terms of about being able to claim the right to live in an unviol unviolated context uh, rather than a set of regulations and coda in terms of the sort of responsibilities. When you use the word witness, for example, mm. witness in the sense that you're talking about has a different meaning. Um, you, so you really what you're talking about is evidence because obviously uh, the, the way that the world's yeah. changing yeah. and we see evidence of climate change, etc., yeah, yeah. it's evidence... To use the term witness is 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 is, uh, um, is an ambiguous word because yeah, it, no, it means it something is. different compared with what you you talk about when you talk about a human witness. It's true, yeah, and that's. I mean, that would be a much longer um, paper, and it's precisely that in ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, no, completely. So, I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to do is look between the legal understanding, and of course, there you have evidence as opposed to the witness functioning in a different manner, but then also look at more sort of social understandings of the witness. So if we think about a kind of ethical or political sense of the witness figure, the idea is that you can extend that beyond the human. And so the human can be a political or an ethical witness figure in relation to the milieu in which they're functioning. Well, I think you'll be Maybe, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm expanding sorry to interrupt. It, yeah. Maybe we can take this to the discussion. There's two more questions. No, one I agree. I mean, I'm expanding it definitely because there's many different bodies of testimony theory, legal theory. You have it in the arts. So the idea of the witness is already in a very expanded term. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah good. I can't see yeah. you. Thank, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it was uh, yeah, incredibly rich and, and very interesting. I wanted to ask about, uh, you mentioned something about the witness being like a, having a sort of a futurity. Yeah. And I found that to be like really interesting. I wanted to ask if, like how does that play out with the witness being, like the figure of the witness being a, perhaps also being like the possibility of taking the witness as a reactive force, mm -hmm. as kind of something that doesn't allow for futurity in a way and maybe only comes afterwards. And mm. I'm thinking very specifically of the um, very topical case of, um, you know, the kind of future war that's going to kind of take place in Venezuela right now, which is going to involve the whole mm. um, geography of, you know, kind of what is being shown in here and what's being thematized in all of these mm. examples. Or because of the kind of oil reserves that will be kind of, you know, that there, there's no access to all these oil reserves that need to be burned mm. somehow. So, I mean, I, like that's, that's one of kind of like, yeah, like the issues with the witness perspective yeah. that I'm, I'm kind of finding a bit, uh, yeah, like kind of troublesome, but also interestingly troublesome. I wanted to ask about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, really important. And it goes back to the first question because it's a kind of expanded sense of the witness. Um, I mean, the witness has been approached from many different fields. So legally, I mean, it would be very... It's not like you have a court of law where you have a trial and someone testifies to what will happen, not as a witness, although we know that politics and many sort of geopolitics is predicated upon that. We know in terms of targeted assassinations and so on and so forth, that's all based on the predictions of what a person, a crime will, a person will commit. But I'm not saying that the witness can legally stand in a court of law and say, I think that this is going to happen. But in the expanded context of witnessing, it's basic, again, it goes back to, and it sort of needs more discussion, that sort of relationship between the witness figure and evidence. So there's much discussion in the context of nowadays and climate change of practices of sensing that somehow sense, that narrate and register invisible environmental degradation. Um, that's taking place all around us. Like how do we find the scientific tools, but not only scientific, but also narrative tools to somehow express these changes in terms of toxicity and so on and so forth, these like 
molecular changes that we can't see and we can't point to direct evidence, we can't, we can't locate accountability for. So it's in the context of that that I'm thinking, okay, how do you also have a kind of ethical or social form of witnessing that somehow narrates ongoing effects of climate change um, or deprivation. So I'm following the work of Rob Nixon when he's talking about slow violence or the work of Elizabeth Povinelli where she's talking about exhaustion, endurance, or what she calls quasi-events. So these are events that can't be captured. They spread out temporally. So how do you find ways of bearing witness to that? And the point being that often those events that are durational, they're also, they are spilling out into a future. So we have all the discourse around extinction. We know, and this is why the, the Sensing Lichens project is interesting, that we see how various species are modifying in relation to each other and in response to environmental damage. Um, so in a sense, they are predicting a future um, uh, a future status, let's say. And it's something that you can also read into the, the reading of the, the Amazon through the Tavares and Beeman work and through Kohn, that in a sense, if forests are thinking and if they are communicating and different species are communicating, they're also adapting. So they're, they're, that communicating is following a temporal continuum where they're adapting to past conditions, but they're also, in a sense, predicting a future condition. So legally, of course, it wouldn't work, but I'm thinking, and also it's in, a, in the context of a much bigger project around witnessing collectivities that somehow respond to conditions of neoliberalism and neoliberal governmentality that are somehow pushing back against that. Um, so it's more political, social. Yeah. I would like to say that I think nature is taking responsibility. Uh, if a tree is dying in a forest and it knows it's dying, it will pass on a lot of its carbon content to the yeah. trees around it through the mycorrhizal fungus underneath. It is cooperative, it is collective. Yeah, it's recep it is, receptive, it, it, reciprocal, so yeah. I would say that nature intrinsically takes responsibility mm. for itself and uh, in, in and of itself. And I think we've got to take control of the narrative. The, 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 the speaking, I mean, you today have been speaking about the Amazon a lot and mentioning mm. how we should look after it, but in fact, it's the Canadian forest that is being the most destroyed environment mm. at the moment, but it's not mentioned because it's in the WASP environment of yeah. the, the, the separation of, of, of races and so forth. And also you've got the, the very concept of um, evolution. Uh, the thing that all people in the West think of straight away is survival of the fittest. And this is basically wrong. That the majority, something like 80% of the plant species on the planet rely on this mitochondrial fungus to feed and the, the, it, it, it's... It, communicates between all the trees. They pass on all sorts of messages between themselves using this system. And it's cooperation and symbiosis that has pushed life, that has progressed forward. And we're losing the narrative because we're talking about things like drilling for more oil. It's got to be burned. That this is simply pushing forward the capitalist ideas like survival of the fittest says that I can be at the top and I should have 20 billion pounds because you are weak. So, you know, you deserve nothing. It's, it, it's the narrative that's got to change. I think the, the, the knowledge is already here. It's yeah. how we use this knowledge that, that we're not doing correctly, I, I believe. And to, to say that nature has to take some kind of responsibility if you're giving it a witness level of, of understanding and that the perspectivity that everything has a soul, a spirit, I mean, it, it's wrong. You, you cannot, you can anthropomorphize, but you cannot project it's just not reasonable. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Uh, you sort of answered my question um, when you answered that guy, so I was going to come in a slightly different angle, um, looking at what the word anthropo uh, anth anthropologist and how they have problems in themselves um, trying to get dialogue or understanding a community when they, with that whole observe the subject problem. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps the gentleman was trying to state, but you were you on about animals, like if a tiger ate somebody? Or just, just the terminology. 
Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. And then he sort of went on. Uh, you, you answered the question, so I had to wait my turn, basically. So I've just had I to mean, It's something lines, that also basically. might be nice for the discussion later, because I'm sure Michael's paper will feed into it. Yeah. Maybe take, we take one more question and then follow with yeah. Michael's presentation. Thanks. I, I have two, actually, but I'll keep them really, really quick. <laughs> um, first one was just kind of following on from that quote towards the end mm. um, about kind of life in general being semiotic. Yeah. And, and what followed from that was uh, about other, other beings being able to represent. Yeah. And it just, it just strikes me, it depends where you go for your semiotics, yeah. whether yeah, it's yeah. representation. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's kind yeah. of a subset of, of semiotics in general. Yeah. For, I mean, but it's, yeah, yeah, it's a kind of a question. And the other is just about kind of where for you the difference between witnessing, mm. um, where witnessing ends and simply just kind of registering mm. something begins. So in the case of the ice, yeah. it, se it seems like that's just kind of registering or even, even kind of slowing or freezing down, yeah. capturing something. So yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, will you touch on the first one, question? Slightly. Yeah. No, I mean, in the Cohen book, he's using Pierce in semiotics. And I think the point is like to try and cut a really long story short through the book, that it's just the point that we need to rethink the fact that, that humans, that representation has to be linguistic um, and that we're the only ones who are capable of it. But that question about registration and representation is really important, and it's something I'm trying to figure out how to cut through, and also then which theories am I going to use to cut through it. Um, but I think what is important for me is that if something's registering or registering traces, it's, reg it's a passive surface matter in which it's registering, right? Whereas I'm trying to think about something a little bit more active. So, yeah. I think that when we're looking at rather than... So let's say Naimanis is talking about ice as representing its, writing itself, let's say, and that's sort of graphomatic and it's in terms of traces, right? Traces that are inscribed, inscription. That's different to then saying, okay, we could have an environment and we can have different species that together are creating a story because there's something active, there's a process change happening there rather than simple registration, yeah. And that registration would be the evidentiary, whereas I think the, the, that's why I'm using the term witnessing and the terminology of the witness because it's something more proactive in a sense. Hence the speculative that I was ending with with Gabris in terms of something's being created there rather than simply a reactive response. Yeah. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, just a quick reminder, there's water in the back if anyone feels like having a cup of water. And I'm um, uh, happy to welcome Michael and to take some of these questions then to discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Sofia and Carolina, for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you here at, uh, at the Contemporary and to be in conversation with Sheila as well. And we discovered that there are lots of points of contact and, uh, and, and really resonances between uh, our approaches. What I would like to do today is um, uh, touch upon three areas uh, related to plants. Plant thinking, plant perceiving, and plant listening. Uh, and, and show how each of them is nestled really within, uh, uh, within the others. Uh, as, as I was listening to uh, uh, Sheila's talk, it occurred to me that listening itself is a kind of contradictory activity and it, it uh, uh, comes through at the philosophical or theoretical level. So that for Hegel, uh, the hearing sense is one of those ideal distance senses together with vision. In order to be able to do it well, there has to be enough of a distance between us and the stimulus. If it's too close, we won't hear anymore. And so it's uh, ranked high up there in the hierarchy of the senses. And music uh, among the arts that corresponds to it uh, is, is one of those higher uh, arts on, the, uh, on, on this kind of teleological hierarchical scale. On the other hand, listening is a kind of um, uh, sense that, is, that renders us passive. In, in, in this, in, uh, not only passive, but we, we cannot, uh, uh, initially as babies, we cannot prevent it. I mean, a baby can close her eyes, but cannot really shut her ears. So it's a sense that is permeated, that is so receptive, all of our senses are receptive, but the sense of hearing is so receptive that it uh, opens the, 
the being who hears up to, to the world. So uh, already in and of itself, it has this contradictory structure of the highest, most ideal of senses, uh, a distant sense, as Hegel calls it, and on the other hand, something that is so intimately close that invades and, uh, and, and almost penetrates the, the baby's ear to the extent to which the baby cannot, cannot shut it out. This is Freud's position, uh, actually. And so this paradox for me is important exactly because the hypothesis I would like to venture with you today regarding thinking, planned thinking and thinking in general as well, is that to think is to juggle the extremes. This would be, speaking about definitions, that this would be my definition of thinking. To think is to juggle the extremes, living with and in their mutual contradiction in the proverbial excluded middle of formal logic. So this is what formal logic excludes is where everything actually happens, where life happens, where growth happens, in the middle between the extremes. And, and thinking happens there as well. To think is to be able to juggle those extremes from the excluded middle. And it immediately follows from this hypothesis that logic does not think, because it has to exclude the middle. Right? And here I'm paraphrasing Heidegger's uh, diagnosis in what is called thinking, uh, where he says, science does not think. And this is a, a quote from him. And on the contrary, who can perform the balancing act better and with more dedication and self-abandon than a plant, the act, the balancing act of thinking? Relevant as such phenomena are, I'm not just referring to the simultaneous germination of a seed upwards and downwards toward the light and toward the dark moistness of the soil. So plants are master uh, thinkers in the sense in which they live in and with this contradiction. They live in two worlds at the same time, at least in two worlds, below ground and above ground, in the dark and in the light. Right? And so they, they have to juggle the extremes in that sense. They have to think, uh, at least in this sense. But this is not the only thing I'm referring to. Nor am I alluding to how vegetal life spans the polar opposites of the uh, elemental world, the earth and the sky, and in a sense keeps the elements together, prevents them from falling apart or falling out with themselves. What I have in mind in relation to the plan uh, uh, part of our title uh, what, what I have in mind is the coincidence of rigor and pliability in the plant that requires the support of cellulose cell walls and the stability of the trunk or the stem to lift it up, as much as the pliability of the leaf and the petal, not to mention the probing sensitivity of root tips to explore the place where it grows and to open itself up to the outside. So if formal logic was the system of rigidity, of mineral-like rigidity that passed itself for thinking, this is not thinking because to, to think we need, we, we need a certain, uh, 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 to some extent, rigid structure, but we also need the pliability and the nimbleness uh, uh, as well. That is precisely what thought is. Rootedness and movement, structure and process, being in place and displacement. In a word, thought is growth. I have just asserted in the same breath that to think is to juggle the extremes and that thought is growth. How to reconcile these two statements? How to balance them in thought? But then isn't growth itself a precarious balancing act, always on edge, rather than the relentless expansion or quantitative augmentation we've come to associate it with in modernity? Right? When we think of economic growth, it's always more of the same an augmentation of value, an increase of a homogeneous quantity. And it's a very impoverished notion of growth. It draws on, on a certain, let's say, natural phenomenon, but, but really impoverishes it and, and uh, reduces it to a single dimension. Sustainable growth, for instance, does not crave more and more, but rather revolves around knowing when to stop expanding and for how long. And plants are sustainable growers exactly in the sense in which they have to juggle, they have to balance, the demands of the reproductive phase, which is inversely proportional in its energy investment to the vegetative growth. So when plants are about to start reproducing flowering varieties, when they uh, have to put all of that energy into, fl into uh, flowering, they stop their vegetative increase, the growth of actual uh, leaves and branches and so on. So they have to uh, juggle these two extremes uh, of growth as well. Plant thinking depends on working with the contradictory demands of growth and reproduction that at the functional level 
correspond to a need for balance in the qualities of vegetal rigidity and nimbleness. The kind of dumb increase in matter that provides us with our uncritical conception of growth, particularly in the plant kingdom, is a figment of theoretical imagination. Even the fast and desperate elongation of the stem, eager to grow out of the shade and stretching toward the light, is far from unintelligent. The life and death juggling act it performs allows it to leave the danger zone, albeit at the price of the vibrancy and robustness of what grows uh, actually out of that shade, uh, because what grows out is a pale and feeble stalk and leaves. The ultimate extremes thinking must navigate are the thinker's self and its other. Cognition is not the purely interior endeavor philosophers have taken it to be, at least since Descartes. When we think about thinking, we think it's this inner uh, uh, monologue or the inner uh, act of representing something to ourselves. But uh, uh, there is nothing purely inward about it. As soon as one brushes aside that privatized image of thought, itself economically complicit, right? So uh, this privatization of thought uh, arises in a certain economic uh, uh, system and structure. Once we brush it aside, it becomes clear, both in the philosophical and biological evolutionary registers, that thinking is, is an ongoing negotiation, a dialogue or a plurilogue with the world, over and above or below a symbolically or linguistically mediated discussion. So it's a dialogue, but not necessarily linguistically mediated. The structure of thinking is a conversation, and hence nothing stable, a construction in flux, invalidating the traditional distinction between structure and function, or structure and dynamics. As for plants, they think at the edges of their bodies, at the surface of leaves, across their merry stems, or at the tips of the roots around which transition zones form uh, that are home to fungi, uh, bacteria, and other microorganisms that are engaged in uh, uh, these polymorphously perverse uh, exchanges of, of uh, information and other symbiotic uh, exchanges. Symbiotic and biosemiotic. We, we touched upon this uh, uh, notion of biosemiotics, which is beyond uh, linguistic representation. It's very clear that uh, that these exchanges at the transition zones around plant roots uh, uh, where multiple species collaborate and, and cooperate are biosemiotic exchanges uh, conducted in these zones. And these exchanges enable the roots to pursue an intelligent course of growth toward the most fertile and water-rich patches of soil, that is to think with others in collaboration with others plant and not non-plant others, encountering them at the threshold of the self, constitutively open to them. So to think in this way is ultimately to juggle the extremes of self and other. Thinking, we might say, happens on the brink where polar opposites, for instance the self and its other, stare each other in the face and are brought into a relation by the thinker-juggler who is neither and both self nor and other. Plants, in turn, are the multiplicities of such brinks or thresholds at their outer physical limits, as much as in every one of their semi-autonomous parts. So uh, we were talking about the forest, but I, I was going to say that every plant in and of itself is already a forest, mm. right? This is what, what, what it means to question the individuality, uh, the unicity of a uh, plant. A plant is a multiplicity of semi-autonomous growths, is already in and of itself uh, a forest. So a forest is a forest of forests, as you, you were saying, a society of societies in the uh, meridian uh, um, uh, way of, of thinking, which means that plants are the most intensely thinking beings imaginable. Assessed in terms of the firing of neuronal synapses, thinking similarly foregrounds the in-between the intervals, the clefts separating the neurons that pass electrical or biochemical signals to one another. The more synaptic branches and by implication clefts there are, the more potent cognitive activity becomes. 
Uh, and my uh, colleague, a plant scientist from the University of Bonn, František Baluška, is actually quite uh, interested in this uh, vegetalized image of the uh, nervous system, right? So the uh, neurons are the most vegetal cells, even morphologically by uh, their appearance, the most vegetal cells in our bodies. Uh, and, and they have all of these branches that actually the more branched a neuron, the more thinking activity there is, right? Which uh, uh, leads us... Uh, uh, to certain conclusions about plants and thinking as well. Uh, so plant vegetal growth provides the model for neuronal arborization and is not at all different from this intensification of thinking. When auxiliary branches and lateral roots emerge, a plethora of opportunities arise for a plant to inhabit the intermediate space between itself and its milieu. So the idea is that we live and think, and plants live and think, in this intermediary space between self and other, between uh, the, the uh, thinker and uh, its or her or his milieu. And, and uh, uh, the, the more branches, the more of these opportunities arise uh, uh, as well. These interfaces proliferating thanks to modular growth that reiterates existing plant structures in a deceptively redundant process are the spatial representations of a cognition that no longer obeys the Cartesian distinction between the extended thing and the thinking thing. So we have left completely this privatized image of a thinker uh, immersed in uh, uh, the thinker's own inner world uh, in the interiority of a monologue uh, uh, in, in, in one's head. If structuration is unsurpassable, then Hannah Arendt's suggestion to think without banisters is simply unacceptable. Thinking happens nowhere but on the banisters, on these edges uh, uh, of, of, uh, of being. To be sure, they are somewhat peculiar, our banisters, made not of, not of dead wood, but of, not of timber, but of the living trees that, thinking their way through the world, open the possibilities for thinking to, non, uh, to formerly non-vegetal animal and human beings. When Arendt recommends removing the protections that guarantee the thinker's security, this is what, what's at stake in her uh, suggestion to think without banisters. It's this abandoning the safety zone, the security of thinking. Uh, and, and this word, too, is, of course, prevalent in contemporary political discourses in the name of which terrible violations of human and non-human existences are justified, this word security. When, when she recommends thinking without banisters, without the secure comfort zone, she beseeches her readers to take the risk embedded in genuine thinking. But isn't a life lived within the dynamic structure of unresolved, irresolvable contradictions, that is to say, the life of juggling the extremes, highly perilous in its own right? Insofar as a plant juggles the competing demands of growth and reproduction, what is above and what is below, itself and the others, it lives and thinks, or it live, lives things, uh, uh, hyphenated, dangerously, always on the brink. The freedom of vegetal thought, vegetal life thought, is not indeterminate, even though it troubles the polar opposites between which the plant stretches out, setting their structure in motion. Between non-theological salvation and perdition, thinking is a risk worth taking. And the alternative is worse, it's much worse. The greatest risk is not taking risks, which is what our neoliberal uh, uh, logic tries to convince us uh, uh, with, with all of its risk analysis, and, uh, analysis and, and assessments. At the level of their species beings, plants know this exceptionally well, which is why they have lived and thought both more extensively and more intensely than we humans have. Section two is on perceiving. So plant thinking, now plant perceiving. There is nowadays a growing scientific consensus that plants detect variations in their environment from changes in light to humidity gradients, from graviotropism or the pull of gravity determining the upward growth of shoots and the downward extension of roots to different kinds of touch. So this is beyond dispute that they are highly sensitive to uh, over 20 environmental factors and conditions. Yet the bone of contention, which the scientific community is unlikely to chew anytime soon, is the so-called question of plant intelligence. Can plants think? Do their capacities amount to more than a hodgepodge of biosensors? 
or to put it slightly differently, are they adapted not only for perception, but also for cognition? In the conclusion to his influential book, What a Plant Knows, Daniel Hamowitz, who is a plant scientist, veers on the side of caution. Although he is happy to talk about plant awareness and the glut of things plants know, on matters of intelligence, Hamowitz remains unconvinced. According to him, since plants have no brain, cannot suffer, and are unable to engage in a two-way flow of meaning with us, and this is his term, two-way flow of meaning with us, every attempt to attribute intelligent behavior to them is doomed to an anthropomorphic hyperbole. I will not puzzle over blatant oversights, unforgivable even to a non-philosopher, of postulating the existence of knowledge and awareness without thinking, or of conflating anatomical structures, in this case the, the brain, the central nervous system, with the functions that they, that they perform here, cognition. I will instead, and, and this is an important point for me, so uh, we, we have to uh, uh, decouple in our minds structures from functions. We always, when we, see, when we think of an eye, we think of vision. So uh, uh, beings that have an eye can see. Those that don't have an eye cannot see. This is absolutely wrong. It ha it's absolutely wrong both in the case of perceiving and in the case of thinking. We think uh, if, if a being has a brain, then it's a thinking being, right? But it is nothing but the conflation of a structure and a function. The same function can be performed in the same manner, if not better, uh, using other anatomical structures. And we'll, we'll get to this in the case of plants. I will instead uh, take up a more difficult issue with uh, uh, Hamowitz, namely the co-imbrication of thinking and perceiving. And I don't think that there is a really a, a, a huge difference between the two. So that perceiving is already thinking. We cannot perceive anything, like this glass of water. I cannot perceive it without thinking, without already interpreting, attributing meaning to it. Meaning to it. I do not see a transparent blob, but I, I see it already as a meaningful uh, thing. Therefore, thinking is ingrained in perception. Beyond the world of plants as well, the meaning of thinking, which I have associated in the beginning with the ability to juggle the extremes, is pending clarification. And mine was a, a first attempt, at, uh, an initial attempt at this <coughs> clarification. If this process involves nothing but abstract intellection achieved through a more or less proficient manipulation of concepts, then there is no doubt that, that non-human beings and many humans to boot do not take part in it. Right? If thinking is nothing but abstract intellection, it is a purely human activity, and in fact many humans are also uh, excluded from it. Conceptual thought is, however, exceptionally restrictive. The confinement of thinking to, to thinking to conceptuality intended, above all, to maintain and reinforce the already threadbare mind-body split and its attendant inequalities. The mind thinks while the body senses translates into the human thinks while the non-human at best senses, and further into some humans think while others only sense. Right? All of these statements uh, mistranslations, uh, uh, crude mistranslations, belong together. In the same violent gesture, the dogmatic heritage of Cartesian skepticism expels thinking beings from their bodies, that philosophically speaking have little that is inherently human about them in, in our case, renders ontological the class and racial divisions among human groups, particularly as they relate to the division of labor between its manual and intellectual modalities, and banishes other living beings, non-human, other than human li living beings, from the sphere of cognition. Having been segregated from the rest of corporeality, thinking is concentrated in the brain, leaving behind body machines, automata that move by virtue of a decision-making core located in the head. But more recently, and curiously enough, the brain itself has fallen prey to machine logic. With thinking treated as a set of algorithmic operations, the control and command center, which is, which is the brain, becomes a sophisticated computing device. Perception is reduced to a series of inputs, the data procured from the outside world, while thinking is information processing. We all uh, recognize the, uh, in this caricature the way that uh, thinking is treated nowadays. Uh, thinking is information process, processing 
which yields variable outputs, that is, a plethora of possible responses to the same stimuli derived from the inputs of perception. But this development, a reductionist and uh, really crudely reductionist as it is, has in turn unexpectedly contributed to an extension of the capacity to think to plants. As my colleague from the University of Murcia, Francisco Calvo Garzón argues, plants resort to complex algorithmic procedures in order to calculate, for instance, optimal blossoming time. So they constantly calculate. And if uh, thinking is calculating, if thinking is this algorithmic operation, that then plants clearly also think. Unexpectedly, a generalized scientific reductionism glistens with redemptive potential. Brushing the metaphysical mind-body split away, it subsumes the mind under the very machine logic previously reserved for the body, and so democratizes algorithmically determined thinking, which it now also attributes to other than human life forms. While it dehumanizes the human, its methodology endows plants, animals, and colonies of bacteria with intelligence. As you must have real realized, however, I do not want to equate thinking to certain mathematical functions. My phenomenological point of departure is that the body itself thinks by relating to its world and to itself. Perhaps to take another stab at the definition, thinking is this complex relation, which I have called juggling the extremes, that includes the two-way street of perception, the preeminent passageway for the body's openness to the world and the world's interpretation by the body whether human, animal, plant, or microbial, for instance. In order to be effective, the double relationality of a living extension must involve a conjunction of external and internal stimuli, and it must be also primed for deciphering and making sense to the organism in question. Hence this perspect perspectivalism. Perspectivalism, the perspective of a, uh, every living being, means that it makes sense of itself and its world so that its perception, what, what it uh, gets from the world through perception, is already uh, comes interpreted, right? Uh, comes pre-interpreted almost. But the acts of lived hermeneutics do not happen a posteriori once the signals emanating from the outside have struck their recipient. This is uh, the mistake of the information processing model that has been ingrained in our heads uh, by now. As phenomenological philosophy has shown time and again, sights, sounds, tactile expression, impressions, etc. do not arrive shorn of meaning. They come pre-understood as the sun setting over the sea, the blowing wind, or the touch of someone's hand. Perceiving, as such, is a manner of thinking, juggling the extremes of the visible and the invisible, the infrared and the ultraviolet, the audible and the inaudible, the rough and the smooth, and plant perceiving is inherently plant thinking. Of course, important differences exist between human and vegetal modes of perceiving and therefore thinking. A plant will interpret the rays of the setting sun in a manner different from the human, for instance, by taking them as a cue for seasonal changes and the growing or diminishing length of daylight. The sensations a plant receives from its environment are not framed as objects, even though they continue to carry meaning for the perceiving thinking body in question. And this is where the representational logic comes to, to its end or to its limit. Uh, so uh, plant perception is not framed in terms of objects. Uh, representation uh, is, is a particular relation between subjects and objects, a particular historical framing that might not even be adequate for the way humans operate, let alone animals and plants. There is no place for representation in the vegetal world, only for the presence of light, pressure, vibrations, and so forth on the extension of the leaf or at the root, uh, at the tip of, uh, tip of the root, and yet a presence that comes with an interpretation. So it's an interpreted presence, but not a representation. Plant cells and tissues are the direct sites of inscription for events in the environment, and at the same time, the loci of interpretation concerned with the consequences these events hold in store. So they are the, the archives, the sites of inscription, and the sites of interpretation at the same time to, 
uh, to, to play with this more active and more passive uh, role of witnessing that you, you were talking about, Sheila. Far from a deficiency, this too has been the holy grail of phenomenology. In the German tradition, Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger all railed against theories of picture thinking, this representational thinking that uh, as if I have a picture of this cup in my brain and that's, uh, that's what uh, uh, lets me uh, understand what it is. Or the construal of perception as an inner photograph-like representation of external reality. While in France, uh, Henri Bergson decried modern philosophy's impoverished approach to the world chopped up into isolated objects. Planned thinking, like the thinking of our own bodies, is neither conceptual nor pictorial. It is the non-theoretical contemplation of the world, a contemplation that does not keep itself separate from the contemplated, but is active and engaged, sensuous and interpretive. The idea which may be gleaned from it is that thinking is not only thinking, within the narrow limits of abstract cognition or judgment, and that the dynamism of thought is indebted to this excess of thinking with respect to itself, this non-identity of thinking with itself and its intimate bond to perception. So if I'm saying that perception is already thinking, there is uh, something more uh, to thinking than thinking uh, narrowly understood. Uh, there is this excess of, of thinking over itself. Formulaically expressed, Thinking is not equal to thinking. Such a non-identity is the exact opposite of the algorithms that contemporary scientific reductionism loads it with. That unequal sign is where the freedom of plants and our own takes refuge in this non-identity of thinking with itself. And finally, in conclusion, uh, very brief remarks on listening as it relates to, to plants in particular. To recap, plant thinking is a term that is not cognitive, or at least not just cognitive, revolving around the non-identity of vegetal being, as I put it already in plant thinking, it flies in the face of the insanity of transcendent thought. It thinks then in the imminence of existence, in this excluded middle, right? The imminence of existence, that is to say the excluded middle, that does not belong to either of the extremes and that at the same time belongs to both of them, with and as the other, juggling the extremes of the self and the other, including the selfhood, the selfhood and the otherness of thought itself. There is no strict distinction between thinking and feeling, thinking and sensing, thinking and being, thinking and living here. Plant thinking turns out uh, inside out into plant seeing, plant listening, plant touching. And what I propose is that we together examine the seemingly strange case of plant listening. By definition, the rules of plant thinking apply to it as well. If plant thinking is simultaneously the thinking of the plants themselves, our thinking about plants, and the dynamic interaction between these two poles of the event, then plant li listening is how the plants themselves listen, our listening to them, and the resonance of their and our auditory attentions. So first, the listening of the plants themselves. And this is contentious even in, in scientific literature. Uh, are plants capable of listening? Of, uh, do they have a sense of hearing? Obviously without recognizable ears, and this is where we come back to this distinction between structures and, and functions, anatomical structures and functions that might be served by other means. Obviously without recognizable ears, plants are all ears. The vegetal body or bodies, the proliferation of these semi-autonomous growths or forests within the one plant, the vegetal body attuned to the minutest vibrations above and below ground. To be all ears, as the idiomatic expression goes, is to be exceptionally attentive. I'm all ears, I, I'm very attentive to you, right? Open to others and to the world. Plants exhibit such extreme attention to, as I mentioned, more than 20 environmental conditions. Uh, and so why would they not be sensitive to sounds and vibrations? Consider these three representative examples. The roots of corn seedlings emit and register clicking sounds at particular frequencies, most likely as part of their underground communication strategies or probing for underground water uh, uh, sources. Flowering plants 
exhibit strong reactions to buzz pollination, releasing their pollen in response to buzzing sounds, even when no actual insects are present in lab conditions. So if a plant is blossoming, is flowering, and you in the lab you play a, re a sound recording of buzzing insects to it, it will activate a mechanism that will release its pollen uh, uh, to, to facilitate uh, pollination. Leaf vibrations resulting from herbivore chewing prompt adaptive or respon uh, defensive responses by the affected plant, as well as other plants to which the threat is biochemically communicated. And here again, in lab conditions, you can simply play the sounds of an insect chewing on a, on a leaf, and uh, a plant that hears those sounds will activate its adaptive responses, its defensive responses. For instance, releasing volatile uh, biochemicals to repel the, the insect in question. So plants are all ears. Perhaps we should also hear this idiomatic expression literally. The functional equivalent of human and animal ears is not localized in one particular structure of vegetal anatomy. It is dispersed throughout the entire plant, which listens with its entire body to its whole environment. Plant listening is, in a sense, a bit like thinking, uncoupled from the brain, if not the central nervous system, and diffused throughout the body. Now, because vegetal ears do not have a specific site, they overlap with the plant's lungs and mouths, eyes and skin. All ears, the plant is all eyes and all thinking, all vibrant and vibrating with life in every part. Because, of course, the leaves also have photosensitive cells. They are also engaging in exchange of gases. They are breathing and uh, they are the surfaces that uh, uh, register all of these uh, vibrations and auditory stimuli from the environment. Second, our listening to plants. This, of course, has been an unmitigated failure, uh, um, with the exception of certain poetic insights and the budding, though still quite small, field of plant bioacoustics, and here the work of Monica Gagliano, uh, an Italian researcher who works in Australia is uh, really pioneering uh, the field of plant bioacoustics. With the exception of uh, these uh, instances, the human consensus on the silence of vegetation has been overwhelming. We take the fact that plants lack recognizable ears and an apparatus for generating sounds akin to ours or to that of animals who are similar to us for evidence of their muteness and absolute deafness sheltered from the very possibility of hearing. We, who without giving it a second thought, subscribe to such a view, judge plants in advance, we prejudge them, and in, it is this prejudice that deafens us. So by thinking prejudicially that plants are deaf, uh, uh, we actually deafen ourselves uh, to uh, what, uh, what they have to say, in a sense. For too long, Vegetal hypersensitivity has slipped through the cracks of our crude perceptual and cognitive systems. In 2019, this failure of discernment is no longer excusable. And third, the resonance of human and vegetal auditory attentions has been consequently fraught and doubly asymmetrical. While plants co-vibrate with us and with the rest of the world, we do not. While they are all ears, we have only two which, to add insult to injury, are unable to pick up the bioacoustic signals emanating from plants. Just as plant thinking requires the ongoing work of reconfiguring and transfiguring the symbiotic relation between human thought and vegetal existence, so the attunement of human listening to that of plants needs to be patiently refined, finessed. How? And with the, with these ruminations on how we can adjust our listening to the listening of plants, I, I will be concluding these remarks. I propose that we learn to listen with our entire bodies, rather than exclusively with the ears. So we should also be all ears in this sense, that the whole body listens. In fact, it would be a matter of merely discovering something that is inconspicuously there, as opposed to acquiring a new skill. It would then be a matter of laying bare the repressed vegetality of our own bodies and psychic strata. Vibrations do not strike the ear alone. They affect every material medium 
and are ready to be picked up by any sentient surface. The first sentient surface of our bodies is the skin, and it turns out uh, that its vibrations convey information to the brain in this way similar to the auditory system. So the skin vibrates, and uh, uh, those vibrations are conveyed to the brain in a way uh, that is very similar to what the ears do. The skin, I would add, is probably our most vegetal organ, breathing through its pores like a leaf, sensing light without being an eye, hearing vibrations without being an ear. It's like we're wrapped in this gigantic leaf, uh, in a sense. And by the way, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm trying to do the exact opposite than anthropo uh, anthropomorphizing plants. I'm trying to vegetalize people. Uh, and not to vegetalize them uh, from the outside, but to show a certain vegetality that is already there and has been repressed over centuries, if not millennia, of Western thought. The scope of what we listen to would also change following the lead of plants. Besides technologically altering the perceptual thresholds within which we typically receive sounds, we would no longer seek speech and song, howling and chirping, hissing and roaring as the indicators of communication that is conflated with vocalization. So to communicate is not just to, to vocalize. Clicking and buzzing have been heard sometimes using sophisticated equipment amplifying our bodily capacities, they have been heard as mere noise, but not really listened to. And here, the difference between hearing and listening is, is crucial. The expanded scope of listening entails a painstaking transition from hearing to interpretively attending to sound waves or vibrations, which plants either produce or receive as carriers of meaning. And finally, a resonance of distinct modes of listening deserves a close analysis. I'm not talking about the resonance of sonorities, uh, sonorous resonance of, of plants and, and humans. I'm talking about the resonance of listening, of modes of listening. It is the resonance of ears or their equivalents, not of voices, which means that it is markedly silent. A vibrant silence permeates plant listening, the silence within which speech initially incipiently makes sense. Yet the silence is resonating in the listening of the plants themselves and in our listening to them have been mutually opposed. One has been pregnant with meaning, the other has blocked the semantic flows emanating from everyone and anything, everything not human. These extremes, moreover, have not been articulated in thought. Sure, there have been and there still are cultures, groups, and individuals who do not fit my description and whose ears and indeed bodies have been exquisitely receptive to the vegetal. Still, their existence does little to interfere with the predominant model of plant listening featuring the resonance of all and nothing, of vivacious openness and austere closure, of heedful excess and the dearth of attention. And so a goal to aspire toward should not be carving out exceptional niches of acoustic sensitivity within the mainstream deafness to plants, but rather turning the cultural tide of ontological neglect, of what I call the ontological neglect of plants. Not pricking up our ears and picking the previously inaudible signals plants send, but intervening in the interactive or interpassive architecture of plant listening. Thank you for your attention.